Good morning and welcome to today's event. We are happy to bring to you today's Mistress of Ceremonies, Ruth Ann Page. Good morning, everyone. As mentioned, my name is Ruth Ann Page and it is my privilege to welcome you and thank you for joining us for our health and wellness event today, which is held annually during American Heart Month in February. We appreciate our event registrants and those of you watching the live stream via social media. Kudos to each of you for taking time out for yourself for you, you and your well-being by spending your Saturday morning with us as we focus on stress, sleep, and what you eat, a female's guide to sustaining heart health at any age. Often, many think strokes and heart attacks are medical events that happen to older people, but every year, about 70,000 Americans under age 45 have strokes, and one in five heart attack patients are younger than 40 years of age. That statistic continues to be on the rise in patients aged 20 to 30 years old. All you have to do is just check the news. And some of you are even more familiar based on your own experience and that of your loved ones. With our focus on women, heart disease is the leading cause of death for women in the United States, killing over 314,000 women in 2020. That's on or about one in every five female deaths. So regardless of age, we're glad you're here to get valuable information and amidst a serious topic, hopefully you'll have a couple of laughs to warm the heart along the way. Now I'll move forward to advise you of today's agenda. So following my greetings, we will have a keynote presentation on stress in your heart with Drs. Lauren Laporta and Kelly Bethea, moderated by Dr. Tanya Randall. We have a gift card raffle and will then go to our first workshop on sleep to sleep or not to sleep with Sunil Kumar. We'll have another raffle and then on to our second workshop with Jennifer Klein on healthy eating on a budget and plant-based diets, followed by closing remarks. So today's program is co-sponsored by the Central Jersey Club of the National Association of Negro Business and Professional Women's Clubs Incorporated. And don't worry, moving forward, I'll just say the Central Jersey Club. Uh, also the Monmouth County Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and Concerned Black Nurses of Central New Jersey. On page one of the event program provided to all registrants, you'll see a little bit about each of our organizations. But in brief, the Central Jersey Club has been in existence for well over 50 years, offering our communities dynamic programs to improve the quality of life and the, and the citizens within Monmouth and Ocean Counties. With Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated being founded in 1913, the Monmouth County Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma, Thority, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated has clearly distinguished itself as a public service organization that boldly confronts the challenges of African Americans and hence all Americans. Over the years, they've brought several public service initiatives to our communities. And Concerned Black Nurses of Central New Jersey are a driving force that embraces it and facilitates innovative health practices while providing education in underserved communities. These three organizations have partnered to bring awareness about heart disease and stroke to you. We are elated as we're confident that you'll find today's programming enlightening and informative. So feel free to be engaged and use the reaction icons to clap, laugh, love, and celebrate our dynamic speakers. Now on to the heart of our event today. And yes, pun intended. For our keynote presentation, Stress and Your Heart, we are thrilled to have two wonderfully credentialed speakers, both colleagues from Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, including Behavioral Health Medical Director, Dr. Lauren Laporta, who is board certified in both general psychiatry and consultation liaison psychiatry. 
She is a graduate of the Rutgers New Jersey Medical School and completed her residency at the University of Florida. She also holds degrees in healthcare administration and bioethics. Dr. Kelly Bethea is a health affairs medical director who is a board certified pediatrician with subspecialty certification in adolescent medicine. She is a graduate of Temple University School of Medicine and completed her residency training at the University of Texas at Houston Health Science Center and fellowship training at Christiana Care Health Systems in Wilmington, Delaware. Additional information on our panelists is in your program booklets, so please pursue at your convenience. Today's panel moderator and my credentialed Central New Jersey club sister is Dr. Tanya, Tanya Randall, who will also field audience questions. So if you have a question, please use the Zoom chat feature, which will be monitored. Ladies and gentlemen, without further delay, we present Stress and Your Heart. Doctors? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Glad to see everyone here. Um, I'm gonna start with the first question that we have. Um, I believe the panelists were given the questions so they know what's expected. Um, the first thing, I mean, because we are talking about stress today, we wanna to talk a little bit about the different types of stress. Um, and so if each of you can speak about the different types of stress, acute, chronic, and episodic, I believe are the types of stress. If I could just start to, again, I think this is a wonderful event and I really think everyone should be uh, give themselves a little pat on the back for coming here today and taking that time for yourselves, as Ruth Dan said. Um, I always like to start by saying of stress, we think of stress in a negative way. Well, stress is actually, the absence of stress is dead. So you need a little bit of stress in order to survive, and it does have a huge survival component. And I think the acute phases of stress, that fight or flight response, that we're all familiar with that shot of adrenaline when something happens is actually grounded in evolutionary um, success. You know, when you get that acute reaction to stress, which is highly adaptive if you're a gazelle and you're grazing out on the plane and you're eating grass and everything's fine, and then the lions come along, that shot of adrenaline sends blood flushing, rushing to your muscles so that you can run away, your heart beats faster, you can escape and get away and survive another day. And that's a good thing, that's acute stress. The problem is for humans, we have evolved to the point that we never kind of go back to that set point that gazelles do. They get to the new place, they relax, they go back to doing gazelle things. And they don't worry about the next time the lions are going to show up and, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? How are we going to be prepared? What should we do? Humans, unfortunately, have evolved to the point that we do anticipate the next thing that's going to come down. <laughs> and we do start to worry and think about it. And then we kind of, we never get back to that pre-alarm set point. So we now evolve into a state of sort of chronic stress. <laughs> where the cortisol levels, the adrenaline, it all stays a little bit elevated. And then all the positives that it had now begin to take its toll. Um, maybe Dr. Bethia can highlight that a little bit more on the physiological aspects. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Laporta. And thank you, uh, Dr. Randall and um, team for having us on this uh, very important um, topic. Uh, when we look at the stages of stress, we know that stress can come in many forms. And as Dr. Laporta just went through, the four stages of stress is uh, fight or flight, damage control. Damage control is a place where we try to juggle way too many balls and we try to um, overcome that stressful event. Um, and then we move into recovery where we try to uh, move past the stress. And then we get into the very damaging adapt adaptation stage where we just say stress is, is normal and we normalize the stress. And stress is very um, damaging to the body. It causes what they call an oxidative stress reaction. 
or when the body becomes inflamed or swollen. So you have more, um, your, your blood rushes to different parts of your body. Um, you have swelling in your vessels and it increases your risk for high blood pressure. It increases your rest, your risk for breathing problems. Because of course, when you become stressed, your heart races, then once your heart races, you feel short of breath, then you start to breathe faster. It can cause dizziness and other symptoms. Um, and if your body starts to adapt to these feelings, then you normalize the feelings and you don't recognize when you may be in trouble. And we know that for African-American females or people of color, women of color, 20 years or older, 59% have cardiovascular disease, but only 39% of those people who have cardiovascular disease are aware of the symptoms, the signs and symptoms of cardiovascular disease. And if we don't know the symptoms, then we're at risk for bad outcomes, bad health outcomes. Um, and so we look for the normal symptom. People say, well, I should have chest pain. I didn't have chest pain, so I must be okay. But the subtle signs, which 33, only 33% 33 of the 39% recognize that other symptoms such as vomiting, um, pain that's referred to the shoulder, to the back, um, shortness of breath, other subtle signs that can be a risk factor or a sign that there is something going on. Women, we need to take time to take a step back and recognize when these symptoms are there, don't ignore them. Don't make them normal in your life. Have them checked out. So the stages of stress causes our bodies to go through all sorts of different changes. And we can't get to the adaptation stage where we just normalize the feeling. Exactly. And the other thing that's important is in that state of chronic now stress, instead of just acute stress, where that little bit of cortisol is a good thing, it begins to take a toll on multiple systems in the body. It impairs the immune system which in these times is we've all been worried about getting sick and all of that. We, we actually now are impairing our immune system because of that chronic stress. It impairs the reproductive system as well. You know, one of the things about acute stress and that shot of adrenaline and all that is that your body starts to take the energy and the blood flow away from non-essential parts. And that's your digestive system. So, you know, how many of us have GI problems? You know, you got, I'm Italian. You got the agita, you got, you know, the, the, the constipation, the irritable bowel, you got productive problems. How many of us have that going on? And that's all again from chronic stress and we don't think about it. And I think as Dr. Bethia was pointing out, women have don't have the typical symptoms of cardiac stuff. They'll have back pain. They'll have pain in their neck or their jaw. They don't they have, don't have that classic, oh my gosh, I have chest pain and it's going down my arm and now it's time to call the ambulance. No, it's sometimes very, very subtle. And it's all those kinds of things we don't think about. you know. And in our headaches, chronic headaches, migraine headaches, you know, menstrual irregularities, um, you know, these things are disrupt our lives enough, but the stress can increase all of that. So it's really important that we do recognize those things. Part of what happens too, when we get into a state of chronic stress is what we call learned helplessness. You kind of get to the point that I can't change any of this. I'm powerless to do anything about this stress. And you kind of give into it. And that's when people get, we talk about burnout. That's what burnout is. You're just so overwhelmed, so overcome by everything. You just don't even know how you're going to move forward. And you kind of get through this phase of, well, I don't, you know, I'll, it'll change. And I can just keep doing this. And eventually something will happen and it will change. No, <laughs> we've all been there. I know I've been there where you're in a situation and it's very overwhelming. 
and you just think, well, I can keep doing this and, I, and, and, and eventually things will get better. Well, they don't. You have to begin to make that change for yourself and know that it's okay to make that change, that you don't have to continue to keep doing more with less and struggling. You can reach out, find ways of coping. You know, we get into these stressful situations. We feel as, especially being women, we're caregivers. By nature, we're caregivers. Um, we're wired that way. And we tend to want to take care of everybody else, but we forget about ourselves. But the first thing that happens when you get on the airplane, what do they tell you? The oxygen comes down, you put it on yourself first. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be available to take care of everybody else. And that's an important concept because we think we have to be there for everybody else. Well, what's going to happen if you're not there? If you work yourself to the point and stress yourself to the point that you're not available, you're not going to be there. And then what are they going to do? So you have to take that time. You have to focus back on yourself, reflect back, take the time to decompress and de-stress. It's important. It's important for you and it's important for them. That's not, you know, we tend to feel guilty if we take time for ourselves. We should be doing something for somebody else. No, no, no. You got to take care of yourself first because you have to be there for everybody else. So those are kind of some of the adaptive things that we need to think about when we're feeling that chronic stress and give ourselves the permission to decompress. Okay. So you gave us some ways to recognize the chronic stress, the headaches, the back pain, the neck pain. Um, some of the, let's focus on some of the effects on the sort of the cardiovascular system. Like some people get the headaches, but they don't recognize the headaches may be from high blood pressure. Um, so it's always important, I think, to go to your doctor if you are having symptoms, whatever your symptoms are, and go to a doctor that is going to listen to your system, to, to your complaints, because a number of doctors, you know, they poo-poo, that's just, you know, women being women. How do you more advocate for yourself when you go to your doctor? So... I would like to just take a step. I think that's gr a great uh, segue into, yes, having chronic stress increases your risk of high blood pressure. And we know that in, uh, people of color, African-American people have a higher rate of high blood pressure, which can lead to stroke, which can lead to heart attack and heart failure, as well as our um, communities, uh, staggering rates of obesity, which leads to high fat cells in your blood, which leads to um, the blood vessel, the, the, the fat cells laying into your blood vessels, which causes a decreased flow of blood to um, the area, to essential areas, such as your brain or your heart, which is what causes cardiovascular disease. Um, so all of these oxidative stresses the high lipids, the high fats in your body, the swelling in your blood vessels increases your risk of heart attack and heart failure, um, especially as you continue to get older. And this is why we have not seen a steady decline in cardiovascular disease amongst African-American women at the same rate as we have seen a decline across all other ethnic groups and, um, uh, and men. Uh, because women have a tendency to be, um, again, the caretakers. So I want to kind of roll back a little bit. And I think um, I would be remiss to say that racism and sexism does not play a role in creating these oxidative stressors. Um, when we look at the community, when we look at the world and the way in which African-Americans and people of color are portrayed, Think of the stress that we as women have to endure to assure our families are well, our children are growing and safe. Um, these are all stressors that come into play and increases our risk of high blood pressure, depression, um, cardiovascular disease, 
uh, when we look at, at race as an institution, as systemic um, and structural racism, it, it really does impact our ability to move from the adaptive stage to get back to healing. So, you know, I just want to just kind of throw that out there to everyone to know that, you know, we don't just give up. The problem with our, with people of color is that we adapt and then we decide and we choose to be super. We choose to try to do it all and be all instead of taking that oxygen and putting it on and taking time for ourselves. So it's really, really important to understand that yes, cardiovascular disease is one of the leading causes of death in women. You don't have to be 80. Chronic stress can occur at 20, 30. It depends on where you are and what's going on in your life. But as African-Americans, Latino, Latinx, American Indians, people of color, stress begins in childhood. There's structural racism in the school system. There's structural racism in the workplace. There's structural racism in the social economic constructs of our communities. And all of those play a role in increasing that oxidative stress in our bodies that causes all of these other health issues such as high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, high fat cells in the body. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Laporta to give us some um, techniques or ways that we can try to reduce the stress um, in our bodies uh, with other techniques. Sure. One of the things I think first and foremost is, is again, that idea of recognizing stress and recognizing what's causing it, you know, in, in a certain situations and certain places and things that we're doing. And one of the techniques I like to, to refer people to is something called mindfulness. Um, you know, we're always told to, told to do, you know, we can meditate and do all of that. Well, I don't know about anybody else, but I've always found that to be very difficult trying to turn my mind off and, and just be blank. I don't think that's happened in decades um, for me anyway. So mindfulness techniques are a little bit less daunting, uh, but just as effective. And what that means is bringing yourself into the moment where you are right now. Um, you know, we, we kind of now with, with social media, with our phones, with it, we are so in tune to here and there and everywhere all at the same time. And we're kind of constantly finding ourselves pulled in a million directions and multitasking. And we think that's normal and it's not normal. So we have to kind of retrain ourselves to focus and narrow our focus and look at the here and now and where I am right this second. And it can be something as simple as I'm going to take 10 seconds now. Where am I? When you're starting to feel stressed out, where am I? What's happening right now? I'm not going to worry about what's going to happen five seconds from now. What's happening right now? The meeting I have to get to, I have to go get the kids, the things I have to get done today. No, I'm going to take two seconds. Where am I right now? And what's happening around me? And it can be something as simple as if you're if you're if you're walking from one place to the other and you're outside, gee, the sun is nice. Gee, the breeze feels very nice. I can feel it on me. I can feel it on my skin. Focus on those things. Bring yourself into a sensory mode. There's something called mindful eating. And we do all of us do this. We're eating and we're doing something else. We're eating we're on the phone, we're eating and we're answering emails, or we're you know, eating and on one from here to there. And we don't even realize what we're doing. We don't take that minute to enjoy what it is we're eating. And I know it sounds kind of kind of silly, <laughs> but it's true. Instead of having my sandwich and doing 10 other things, I'm going to have my sandwich. And I'm going to look at that sandwich. And I'm going to taste the sandwich and smell the sandwich and really get into that sandwich. Because now I'm only focusing on one thing. And you'd be surprised how much that 
calms you right down and focuses you right here and there. And it's not like you have to take the time to go in a room and, you know, do the whole meditation thing. You're doing it right then and there. You're being mindful of what you're eating. You're being mindful of the experience of eating. And that's going to calm your stress right down. And those few minutes are valuable. Yes, it's stressful out there, but that couple of minutes that you allowed your body to de-stress, decompress, and your mind to focus are going to have tremendous benefits. It doesn't have to be a half hour, an hour of concentrated meditation. It has to be just a few minutes of focus, calming yourself down, bringing yourself back to your center. And if that's because you're eating, eating something or you're sitting and listening to music for a couple of minutes, you know, even if you have to, you know, Get away from everybody by going in the bathroom and closing the door and, you know, taking your little iPod with you or whatever it is and listening to something that's relaxing or taking the 10 minutes to take a nice soak instead of the three second shower. Those things are really going to be important and they're going to pay off in a lot of health benefits. It doesn't have to be a lot. It just has to be some and frequent. Find things that you like to do. Find things that you're passionate about, um, hobbies. I know it's hard to think about that, but something you enjoy doing. What are you passionate about? What do you enjoy? Do you enjoy reading? Um, taking a few minutes each day to read a little bit, um, needlework. A lot of people like to crochet, to knit, anything that, you know, all kinds of things that you can do. Cooking, cooking is great. I know we have a cooking segment. You know, that's one of my ways of coping. Um, you know, everybody knows if I'm in the kitchen for a while, I must be really <laughs> trying to decompress from something. Um, but I enjoy doing that. And it helps me to focus on something. It helps me relax any kind of creative outlet, anything you like to do. Um, and it doesn't have to be a lot. And something even more simple, turn off the news, turn off the TV, stop the constant barrage, because we get hit constantly with all kinds of things. And it's designed to increase our stress. I think about what we've just been through with the pandemic, okay? We just would start to calm down a little bit. New strain out, everybody. It's more contagious. It's more, and you're like, oh my gosh, didn't we just do this? Same thing after 9-11, you know? And it's a perfect example of, of how stress doesn't go back down. 9-11 happened, and then we had these threat alerts. And we were up here with the threat alert and it was a five and it was a red and it was a green. And it was, you know, we constantly had this new threat, threat, threat. So we have to be mindful again of what do we really need to be stressing about and what can we let go? You know, and I like to try to help patients, especially when I'm working with them, when they have a lot of stress, it's like, think about the things that are stressing you out. Take charge of the stuff you actually can control. Because you can't control everything that's going on around you, but you can control some of it. And you can control how it is affecting you and what you're going to do about it. And again, turning the TV off, not getting that constant 24-7 barrage of threat, threat, threat. Um, what do I really need to be worrying about? You know, yeah, meteor could hit us tomorrow. Can I do anything about it? No. So I'm not going to worry about that one. You know, is, you know, could there be, you know, another, or, yeah, there could, can I do anything about it? No. So what are the things I can take control of? Because the more you empower yourself, even if it's the little things, the more you start to see what you can take control of and you start to feel empowered about those little things, the big things start to feel a little less daunting. So give yourself credit for those things that you actually can take charge of. And remember that the worst things that happened in your, that you worried about happening in your life probably didn't, but you spent an awful lot of time worrying about it, but it didn't actually happen. So, you know, let, you have to kind of do a little self-talk, a little encouragement to yourself and a little reminder that there's certain things you can control and there's things that you can't, you know, I like to always remind people of the, the serenity prayer. Okay. It's not just for the AA group, you know, mm -hmm. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change 
the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. It goes a long way when you really look at that and you live that You say, what are the things I can take charge of and fix? You know, okay. and if I know that and I can focus on that, I'm going to feel a lot less helpless and overwhelmed. And, and one of the other things to remember is that um, sleep, good sleep hygiene. And I know we're going to have a talk, a workshop on, on sleep um, issues, but really setting your, your bedroom up for relaxation and the ability to get a good night's rest. Your body releases, um, releases epinephrine para- and, and, and other um, substances in your body that causes during the day, you're tearing your body down. You're awake, you're running, you're doing this, you're doing that. And at night when you rest, that's when your body repairs itself. So a good night's rest helps your body to repair, repair the gut, repair the the swelling, the inflammation, and it's a time for the body to reset and recharge. So really sleep is important. Putting, if you're a parent, putting your children on a sleep schedule is important because if they're not sleeping, you're not sleeping. (laughs) Um, That's why the old adage, when your baby's asleep, you should be asleep because you have to definitely repair your body. So good sleep hygiene, of course, exercising, which we tend not to do. And it doesn't have to be an hour, 20 to 30 minutes. And it can be broken up into 10 minute increments, five minute increments. Exercising helps to repair the body. It strengthens your lungs. It strengthens your heart. It elongates your muscles. It helps your body to function optimally and reduces heart disease. And be mindful of what you're eating. A lot of times I say, we don't, I don't eat that much. But when you eat five chips in the morning, five chips in the afternoon, five chips in the evening, and that 32 ounce bag of chips is gone at the end of the day, you have consumed all of the calories in that bag. It just wasn't at one sitting. So you don't see it as a problem. Grazing is a becomes a problem. Emotional eating becomes a problem. And in our, in our community, 77% of African-Americans are overweight, obese. So if, you, if we work on how do we manage or cope with our stress, don't use eating, substitute it for a walk, a run, uh, just a, a sit down, read a book, um, and be mindful of what you're putting in your mouth, substitute the chips for an apple. Um, and help to reorganize your your life in a way that helps your body to heal and repair. And that will help to reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease. We went over a lot of ways to reduce stress. Is watching TV a good way to reduce stress? Depends what you're watching. (laughs) No, seriously, depends (laughs) what you're watching, you know? Um, (laughs) If you're watching the news, no, it's not a good way to, to reduce stress. If you're watching, you know, the true crime channel, no, it's not a good way um, to reduce stress. If you're watching, you know, I, I admit I, I like comfort TV, which is, you know, the old sitcoms from, you know, back in the day. It's it's kind of, you know, it's comforting and soothing. It's 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 mindless. It, it feels comfortable and it makes you laugh. And anything that's going to help, you know, laughter is wonderful. Um, for the body and repairs a lot of things. So anything that's going to be sort of lighthearted and and, and entertaining um, and relaxing, anything that's going to be, you know, raising, <laughs> raising your blood pressure and raising your, you know, sense of threat. No, not a good thing um, to be watching. Um, so, um, but again, you know, there's all kinds of people do all kinds of things that they find pa- enjo- enjoyment from, you know, I like to do a lot of, of crafts. I was, while I was waiting for the meeting to start, I was trying to organize my desk because it gets a little overwhelmed sometimes with my craft projects. Um, so yeah, 
uh, but you know, those anything like like that. So anything that you, you find enjoyable and relaxing, and it can be any number of like reading a book or doing some, you know, listening to music. Um, and again, I think what Dr. Bethea was was pointing out is correct, you know, that and, and sort of that sense of we eat, we tend to just shove things sometimes in our mouth and it, you know, we kind of it, as a comfort, and that's really not a good thing to be doing. Um, and again, I think if we do a lot more mindful eating um, and realize, you know, take the time to actually eat and focus on the eating instead of just doing something else um, with one hand in the bag of chips or, you know, the, the bag of cookies and the next thing, you know, they're gone and you didn't even remember eating them. Um, you know, so that's the kind of things that we we have to focus on doing. Um, and and to, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to just kind of answer your question about TV watching. Um, I think you have to be mindful of what you're watching. So again, let's bring in race and race theory. Um, the images we see of ourselves on TV are usually not positive, which can be a what we consider a microaggression against people of color. So if you're seeing multiple images of yourself on the screen and you're not aware that they are not positive images, you internalize that subconsciously and that increases our risk of adaptive stress. So watching TV sometimes can be okay, but again, you have to be mindful about what you're watching and what you're taking in. We have to remember that media dictates what is beautiful, Media dictates what is good. And a lot of times what is good and what is beautiful does not look like what we see in the mirror. So we have to be intentional about making sure that our children, our loved ones are loved, understand that they are beautiful, they have worth. And with giving that information, you're helping to repair the body, reduce the adaptive stress of am I good enough and spend more time with the TV off and engaging in activities such as playing a board game, going for walks together, going to the theater or doing something else doesn't always have to cost them. Go to the library. Libraries have all kinds of fun activities for families if you have children. If you don't have children, go hang out with your friends and have a light lunch or dinner. If you can't afford a big restaurant, go to Burger King, McDonald's. Every once in a while, it won't hurt you. Don't do it every day. <laughs> but the TV can be okay, but you have to be mindful of what you're watching. And when your children are watching TV all the time, you have to remind them that they are worthy, that they are beautiful, and they do have things that are worth, th that they're seen and heard. And I think we have to be mindful about that um, as adults to help start making a dent in cardiovascular disease from stress in people of color as they get older. Yeah, I think you make a good point on your last point about making time for friends and family. That's definitely one of the ways to reduce your stress, except if your family stresses you out. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but if you make time for your friends, because sometimes stress can be very isolating. You can feel, you know, stressed out and therefore you stop communicating with your friends and your family. But, you know, maybe that is the time when you start, you should start to actually reach out to your friends and your family. And I think um, when you are feeling stressed, that. we've lost a lot of that in the last several years because they, it, you know, the whole thing with the pandemic was very isolating right. and, you know, it's, and it's difficult now to sometimes to get back into that um, socializing and, and, and connection. We lost a lot of that. And I think a lot of what came out of the pandemic was just how detrimental isolation was for people, for the kids, for sure. Um, this generation of children and, you know, has been so ice was so isolated at critical times of their development. And then the social media was taking the place of it, which we know is just 
dreadful and, you know, deadly for some of these kids. The rates of depression, um, especially in, in adolescent girls, has gone through the roof. And it's frightening because, again, as we're talking about the situations of chronic stress, these kids are starting out already um, behind, you know, just way behind where they should be emotionally and, and in their maturity. And then having all of this additional stress and negative um, influence is just setting them up for tremendous problems going forward. I mean, as you said, you know, Kelly, the, some of the kids in their twenties are already having these problems. So it's, a, it's scary. And, and we're going to see a lot of this coming up now, I think in younger, younger people with, from the effects of chronic stress. So. People who are having these sort of chronic stress or feel like they're stressed, do you think it's beneficial for them to seek professional help? Or, I mean, if they've tried all these other techniques, we've talked about the eating healthy, the hobbies, the mindfulness, if all of that's sort of not working, is, it, is there a time at which you feel they should, you know, seek professional help? Yeah, they should. How do they recognize that time? The time is when you're feeling um, overwhelmed. So what are the signs or symptoms of being overwhelmed? you're more irritable. You find yourself isolating, not enjoying the things that brought you joy. People are making comments, you don't smile as much as you used to. I think we tend, especially women of color, tend not to ask for help. We tend not to even tell our friends we're in trouble. Um, and so it's time to seek professional help to even if it's not medication, just to talk to somebody, to just let it out, talk about it. Um, therapy is not for crazy people. Therapy is for people who are in tuned and in touch with their bodies and their selves. And if you can't seek help from a psychologist or a psychiatrist or mental health professional, remember our communities have been steeped in the church and in spirituality. Seek counsel from a pastor, from uh, one of your religious leaders. Um, a good religious leader will say, hey, I think you're in trouble. And here is some names of some therapists that we have used in the past. So really being in tune and in touch with yourself. Stop trying to be superwoman. Tell a friend. And if you're a friend and you see your friends are in trouble, pull their coattail and get them to a place of help. Remember that if you're, if you're employed, check with your benefits, your human resources department. There is the employee assistance program or EAP that most companies have. And they usually offer up to six to eight sessions of uh, free counseling per se. And it's really an evaluation. It's a time for you to say, hey, do I, can I connect with this person? Is, will this person be helpful? Um, but really what you're looking for is that, you know, you've lost interest in, in what makes you happy. You don't smile as much. You're feeling more irritable. You're lashing out at people. You're crying for no reason. You're feeling helpless. You're feeling hopeless. You're not seeing the benefit of, of life. So, you know, one thing that I really do think that we have to be mindful of is spiritual counseling is available. If your loved one is in the hospital with a heart attack or heart failure, and you're finding it hard as a caretaker to manage or to cope, you can always ask for the chaplain service to come in and talk to you about how you're feeling and how you're coping. So these are just simple ways that you can seek the help that you need and, and we can support each other in getting the help that we need. And I think that's when we need to seek help, not when we're laying out and can't breathe and can't do anything, but we have to be in tuned and mindful of how we're feeling and don't be afraid to ask for help. Exactly. It's not weakness to ask for help. 
it's the bravest and strongest thing you can do is ask for help. Um, that's, I think we, we have a stigma about that. There still is. If we've done a lot of, uh, made a lot of progress, but there's still a stigma about asking for help. Um, but it's really not only okay, it's necessary. And it's the best thing you can do. And again, I think we, we don't recognize, you know, that when you're irritable and you're snappy and you're just, everything is, you know, you're on your last nerve. Um, that's the time to say, you know what? I need to step back. I need to take a look at what's happening and I need to do something um, to fix this. Uh, and if that means, I, you know, talking to people and it's a lot easier now. And I think Dr. Pathia had some great suggestions, especially with the EAP. Um, now there's even all kinds of options. There's online options, there's telehealth options. So you can always have, you know, find a way to make time to do that. Um, and it's really important to do so. Okay, we're going to take an audience question. Um, how do you, I guess, disconnect from social media? How does, you know, you talked a lot about social media, putting your phone down and focusing on the here and the now. That's really hard to do in today's world because everything is about the social media. So how do, how do you suggest people do that? So you just yeah, do it. Just, <laughs> just do it, yeah. Um, so I had, I, I participate in a, uh, a prayer call every day. Um, and and uh, <laughs> they did a 21 day fast at the beginning of the year. And part of my fast was I'm not getting on Facebook. I'm not looking at it. I'm not checking in. I'm not seeing what other people are doing. And I just put on there, I will not be around for at least 21 days. And it's a habit that you develop. So how do you shut it down? Shut it down. Turn it off. Don't get on it. Take the app off your phone. Um, at night, if you're if you you tend to um uh, check your phone all night long and it's dinging, dinging, ding. Put it on do not disturb. So, um, you know, my my son has ADHD and I would call and his phone would always go right to voicemail. And I was like, what? You know, I'm calling you. You, you need to answer your phone. <laughs> and he told me, he said, I put my phone is always on do not disturb because I find that all those dings, pings is so distracting that I can't concentrate on what is at in front of me. So if you can't put your phone on do not disturb and then in, instruct the people that you know need to reach you, when they call you, your voicemail comes on to then hang up and call right back. And that overrides that do not disturb and they'll know to answer the phone. Um, but the do not disturb button is, is an awesome button. If you can find it on your phone, turn it off. If you're somewhere where you know everybody in your life that you need to be in touch with is safe, turn it off. Make the sure in the house. Have, <laughs> turn it if your children are out and you have sisters, brothers, aunties, uncles, grandparents that can take the call, tell your kids I'm on, do not disturb. I had a friend one time tell me <laughs> she wanted to, she just couldn't take it anymore. And she just went, checked herself in a hotel. And her kids called her. She said, I have run away. I'll be home when I get back. Sometimes we just have to run away. Turn it off. Social media is can be a disaster waiting to happen because you're on there and you're subconsciously comparing yourself to people's lives that are not necessarily true. So everything you see on TV is what, or on social media is what people want to let you see. It's the people that you're with and can touch and talk to on a regular basis where you see the true them. That's who you need to focus on. Turn it off. Do not disturb. Addiction. It can be an addiction. You know, you get a dopamine rush sometimes of doing that. You kind of it, it's 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 electronic crack. And sometimes, you know, it's like booze. It's like anything else. It's really not a good thing. So you know, turn it off. Let it go. Um, and the and you know, it sounds horrible, and it feels like you're going to go into withdrawal, and you might for a few days. But you know what? It goes away, and you get over it, and you get past it. Well, I want to thank you. We only have a minute left. Is there anything you want to say in your 
final minute, give you each 30 seconds to wrap up and bring, bring home your points. <laughs> I, I think everyone's taken the first step by coming here today, by wanting to learn more about what stress is, how to recognize stress, what they can do about it. I think they've gotten some good suggestions. I urge everybody to, to kind of try to adopt at least one positive coping skill. Um, and remember that, you know, there is help out there and that they should not be afraid or hesitate to go get it because it's not just, a, it's a matter of your health uh, overall. And as, as a doctor, medical doctor, check in with your primary care doctor, recognize the signs and symptoms of high stress um, high, um, that can affect your body, create a good sleep hygiene. And I think the one biggest takeaway I'd like everyone to hear is you're not abnormal. It's normal that you're feeling the way that you feel. And what you can do is take control and seek help. And don't be afraid to ask for help. Hit that do not disturb, go to counseling, get on a prayer line, do something for you that's only for you. You're not selfish. It's called self-care. And I implore for you to do it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much. All right. Great. Thank you so much to our panelists and facilitator. Fantastic job. Thanks again, Drs. Laporta and Dr. Bethea for taking the time out of your busy and weekend schedules to share your clinical expertise and the importance of the impact stress and mental health have on our heart. Also appreciate information on tools to reduce stress, like mindfulness and preparing your body through sleep and repairing your body through sleep and exercise. So a round of virtual applause for our panelists and our facilitator today. Feel free to use those icons and let them know that you appreciate the information. A great job once again. Now that we've warmed up our hearts, and with that information, now let's have some fun and warm two of your lucky pockets with a raffle prize. This does not apply to those of you watching via live stream, via social media, but each of you who are registered to attend today's Zoom, who did register to attend today's Zoom event by 8.30 a.m. are eligible to win. So each winner will be contacted with the information you use to register and you will be receiving a $25 gift card. So let's go, good luck. Good morning, everyone. We are excited to bring this special moment to you. We hear that a few of you are ready to win a wonderful prize. So please watch the screen to see if you are the winner. We are so happy to have you here with us today. Please make sure to also access today's event program book. The link can be found in the chat. I think we are ready to spin the wheel. Do a little two-step while you're waiting to see if you are the lucky winner. Looks like our winner is Nina Mathis Norman. Nina, congratulations. You are the winner of a $25 gift card. Again, we will contact you via your email that you used to register for today's event. But don't worry, we I think have one more possible winner before we continue with today's program. Let's spin that wheel. All right. Let's exercise those healthy hearts. Let's get a little two-step going while we look for our second winner for today. And we are happy to say that, Carolina, you are our next winner. Congratulations to our lovely winners for today's program, our Think Heart, Think Healthy program. 
And now we're going to bring back our lovely MC for today, Ruth Ann Page. All right. So congratulations to the winners. Uh, spend it wisely. Hopefully you could do it for something that is heart healthy. We are now excited to get started with our first workshop, to sleep or not to sleep. And as they say, that is the question. So if you're like me, you don't get enough of sleep. So I'm looking forward to this workshop. Sleep specialist Sunil Kumar uh, is here today. He has a bachelor's of medicine and bachelor's of surgery and master's degree credentials. He analyzes sleep data to share with various specialists. Immediately following his presentation, we'll bring back Dr. Tanya Randall to facilitate a few questions from the audience. So please continue to use the Zoom chat feature to ask questions. So Neil, I turn it over to you. Thank you, thank you, Ruthann. Uh, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, my name again is Sunil Kumar and I am in the sleep medicine field. And the work that I do is I analyze the sleep data when uh, patients come to a sleep lab or there is a home sleep study done. Uh, then it comes to me and I will look at the data and find out what is wrong. What is, is the sleep normal? Is it abnormal? Uh, but I was blown away by the previous uh, uh, panelists and the, the, the chock full of information that they gave on stress. And I learned a ton. I actually, I, I have a notebook here and I was taking notes all the time. And uh, it, it, was, it was really very, very meaningful, especially how this uh, adaptation uh, phase of uh, stage of stress is where we don't even know that we are already gotten used to this stress. So, so this sleep is a topic that is right on the heels of that information that we got. And I have a PowerPoint and let me share the PowerPoint and then we'll talk about sleep. Okay. All right. Can everybody see the PowerPoint? Yes, we can. Wonderful. So, so the big question is to sleep or not to sleep. <clears throat> so sleep, as you can see on my slide, accounts for one quarter to one third of our lifespan. So one third or one quarter of our lifespan, we actually need to spend sleeping. Now, before the 50s, most people believed that sleep was just a passive activity. But now we have learned that it's not just something that, oh, we hit the bed and go to sleep and then wake up and nothing happens during the time we are sleeping. Actually, there is a lot of activity that is going on in our brain when we are sleeping. So sleep's a period during which the brain is actually engaged in all these different activities that are very important to our life. And not, on, not only just for our survival, but to give us a good quality of life. And, and a little bit about, you know, a little background on what is sleep, like uh, our previous uh, 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 panelists, Dr. Laporta and Dr. Bethia were telling us, what is stress? Just try to understand what is stress, and then we learn about how to cope with stress. So the same way, we need to understand what is sleep. So sleep is actually uh, constituted by something called a sleep cycle. And you can see on the slide, the first part of the cycle is what we call non-REM sleep. And by REM, it means rapid eye movement. So this is a, a part of sleep that is called non-REM sleep. And during this non-REM sleep, when you hit the pillow, you are drowsy. So that's what we call first stage of sleep, stage one of sleep. It's very light, 
and it's like you have closed your eyes and you feel like you're falling asleep. And then if there is a little knock on the door or a little noise, you wake up because your sleep is very light. And we spend a very small amount of time, like five, 10, 15 minutes in that phase of sleep. Then immediately following stage one, we get into something called stage two sleep, which is also light sleep, but it's not as light as the stage one sleep. It's a little bit uh, more, uh, I won't say deep, but a little more stable than the stage one sleep. So here's the stage of sleep when our breathing regulates, when our body temperature starts to drop. And then we move on to something called deep sleep, which is the stage three of sleep. And that's the stage of sleep when you are actually getting your body repaired of all the insults that it has suffered during the activity uh, during the day. So stage three sleep is the deep sleep, and that's very important to restore us physically. So in other words, if you did not get stage three sleep, you will wake up tired in the morning because your physical restoration didn't happen. And then, then stage three is followed by REM sleep, which is rapid eye movement sleep. And that's the phase of sleep when you start dreaming. So our dreams are formed in REM sleep. So you can see this entire pattern. First, it starts with non-REM sleep, very light sleep, moving into a little more structured light sleep, and then moving into deeper sleep. And then we start dreaming. Now, just like I mentioned about the deep sleep, that that is physically restorative, REM sleep is psychologically restorative. So if we don't get enough REM sleep or we if we did not dream enough, we will be psychologically not restored in the morning. That means we'll snap at little thing, we'll get more irritable, that kind of thing. So, so, so you can see that at a very superficial level, how sleep is connected to the way we behave the next day. So just a little background on sleep. Uh, and then this cycle, we went through the first sleep cycle. We did stage one, two, three, and then REM sleep. This repeats itself. And with, so, so what it means is after the first cycle, we're gonna start the second sleep cycle, which is again, stage one, two, three, and then REM sleep. But what happens is with each cycle, our deeper sleep keeps on decreasing and our REM sleep, which is the dream phase of sleep, that keeps on increasing. So in the first sleep cycle, you may have like five minutes of REM sleep or dream phase. And then in the second sleep cycle, that may increase to 15 minutes. In the third sleep cycle, it may become something like 25 minutes or 30 minutes and so on and so forth. And then early morning, that's when you really get a lot of dreams and your and the reason is your REM uh, sleep may be as long as 45 minutes during the early morning hours. So we go through four to five sleep cycles in the night and each sleep cycle is anywhere between 70 to 90 minutes long. So, you know, if you do the math, you need at least seven, seven, seven and a half to eight and a half hours of sleep, or let's say roughly even number seven to eight hours of sleep, that's what we call the normal sleep for most people. Now, again, people, you know, different people require different amounts of sleep, but this is, uh, if we want to say average, how much people need sleep, minimum seven to eight hours. I would be more on the side of eight hours of sleep a night. Now, let's learn a little bit about what is the body's built-in sleep control? Like, what is there in the body that actually makes us fall asleep? Now, two things to remember is, one is your circadian rhythm, and the other one is your sleep drive. Now, what is circadian rhythm? 
This is what we call the biological clock. And it responds to light, light cues. You know, uh, the time to sleep is night and the time to wake up is morning when, the, when there is light. So as the light comes on, our brain senses that light and it actually decides when we are going to fall asleep based on that. So if we are not exposing ourselves to light, then our entire circadian rhythm cycle is not set the way it is supposed to set. So we wake up in the morning and we should be exposing ourselves to light. And that will tell the brain when the melatonin is going to get released and so on and so forth. Now, the other factor that helps us with sleep is sleep drive. So sleep drive uh, means that how long we have stayed awake. Uh, so let's say we wake up at six o'clock in the morning. By 12, in the, at, by 12 noon, the body is going to say, all right, you are up for six hours. Now that is your sleep debt. And as the day progresses, by six in the evening, we have 12 hours of sleep debt. And then by, you know, as the night progresses, our body is going to say, okay, now it's enough now. You have stayed up for 12, 14 hours, and now it's time to go and fall asleep. So these are the two ways our body decides how we, how we fall asleep. Now, when you are tired, it can put you to sleep, which means your sleep debt is so much that now your body is going to say, you, you're going to fall asleep, which is both good and bad. It's good if you are at home and you have a bed and you're going to fall asleep. But if you have stayed up for that long and you are driving, you're behind the wheel, your body is still going to say that you fall asleep because you have so much of sleep debt. And that can be a problem. When you, you are exhausted, your body also engages in something called micro sleep episodes. And these can be just one or two seconds long. And, and the amazing thing here is our eyes may be open. So our eyes may be open, but our brain is falling asleep. And now the danger of that is if we are behind the wheel or if we are doing some other activity where our full attention is needed, uh, micro sleep can be very dangerous. Again, so what is what is it telling us is the importance of proper sleep, and we'll we'll go into a little bit more how to how to accomplish that. But just to get a little understanding that too much tiredness is going to make us fall asleep, and there is a phenomena of of something called micro sleep where our eyes are open but the brain can can shut for one or two seconds. And then a little bit about napping. If we nap more than 30 minutes later in the day, that can decrease our drive to fall asleep when it's actually time to fall asleep. Now, nap is okay if it is a little bit early during the day and if it's around 20 minutes long. Anything more than that is going to disturb our circadian rhythm, and it's going to decrease the sleep debt that we need to actually fall asleep. So, but anything more than 30 minutes is definitely going to disturb our sleep in the night. So that's a little uh, information about napping. Now, why you need sleep? We, we did establish a few reasons why we need sleep. Uh, we need physical restoration. That's why we need our deep sleep. We need psychological restoration. That's why we need those dreams. So sleep significantly impacts brain function. And, and, and now with all kinds of research, we have established health connections with sleep. Just like uh, Dr. Laporta and Dr. Bethea was were telling us about stress and how that causes, you know, chronic stress causes high blood pressure, and how this high blood pressure is linked to 
uh, you know, events of stroke or heart attack or heart failure. Same way, not getting enough sleep leads to similar uh, medical events. So a healthy amount of sleep is vital for the brain's ability to adapt to input. If you don't get enough sleep, your brain is not going to get the right input or it will take longer for it to adjust to the input. Too little sleep makes us unable to process what we have learned during the day. You know, this is so important. If we are not able to remember things, uh, maybe the reason is we are not getting enough sleep. And, and, and the reason there is that when we are sleeping, our brain goes through a processing time to process the information. And, and then we wake up in the morning and the next day we remember things right if we, if we slept correctly or if we slept for the right duration of time. Uh, so, so, so there is a link there. And then symptoms of depression, seizures, high blood pressure, migraines, they all worsen. Uh, and now there is even connection with, uh, with diabetes. And, and, and there the reason is during our uh, deep sleep, there is something called growth hormone that gets secreted. And that gets secreted only during deep sleep. And, and if there is less growth hormone that is secreted by the brain, then our fat cells keep on increasing and our muscle architecture keeps on decreasing. We want it in the reverse order. We want our muscle architecture to be better and our fat cells to be lower. So that's related directly to not getting enough of deep sleep, of course, uh, amongst other reasons. Immunity is compromised, uh, increasing the likelihood of illness and infection. So, so, so a very direct link of uh, sleeping less and, and catching all those colds and flus. Uh, sleep also plays a role in metabolism. Even one night of missed sleep can create pre-diabetic-like state in an otherwise healthy person. It's, it's, it's just so, you know, uh, almost unbelievable what sleep can, uh, can lead to either on the positive side or lack of sleep can lead to on the negative side in our health. Now, this is the daylight savings time where we spring forward and fall back. And we just, you know, think that everything is automatic and, you know, we're going to adjust. But this, this actually does something to our sleep. And it takes time for us to adjust to this. So if, if you see that around this time, people are cranky and, and, and you know, they are more irritable, it could be related to this one hour difference, which uh, is, is, is giving them all kinds of problems with their sleep. Now, here are a few ways to, to get a healthier sleep. Uh, we need to understand that it takes us normally 10 to 20 minutes to fall asleep after the lights are out. If it's taking us five minutes or two minutes, you know, I, I hear some people say, I have no problem falling asleep. I can fall asleep anywhere, or I can fall asleep in two minutes. What that indicates is that they are very tired. There is something wrong with their sleep. That's why they can fall asleep anywhere. Their body is telling them, you have a sleep debt of probably 20 hours instead of having a sleep debt of, say, 12 hours. So, 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 so we need to have that understanding. If we are falling asleep within 10 to 20 minutes, that's normal. But if it's less than that, then it's not normal, and we need to look into what's the reason. And of course, if it's longer than that, then... It could be something like insomnia or some other kind of situation. And again, that awareness helps. Now, this is another important one. Don't underestimate caffeine. Now, coffee in the morning uh, is, is fine. 
Uh, but if we drink caffeine too late in the day, that will uh, interfere with the nighttime sleep. And the reason is it takes six hours, what we call the half-life of caffeine, for half of that caffeine to actually get out of your blood. It takes six hours. So if we add a cup of coffee at five o'clock in the evening, till 11, that caffeine is still sitting in your, in your system. And caffeine is a stimulant, and it's not going to let us fall asleep. Now, I have also heard people say, oh, I drink coffee and I fall asleep. What, again, it means is that your body is too tired. It is so tired that even when your brain is trying to stimulate itself, your sleep debt is so much that it wins and you, you do fall asleep. Another important part here is the nightcap. Some people think that, oh, one drink in the, you know, before bedtime, it helps them fall asleep. Now that may be true. It does fall, you know, makes them drowsy and they may go to sleep. But what it does is later in the night, it's going to stimulate their brain because alcohol has a dual effect. The initial effect is it's going to depress the brain. It's, it's going to uh, make them drowsy. But after a few hours, it stimulates the brain. And then these folks, they, they are awake and now they cannot fall asleep for a few hours because that's, much, that's how much it's going to take now for the brain to again get tired. And then, of course, the, all the deeper stages of sleep are, are, are going to be all disturbed. And that has effect on memory, concentration, physical coordination, all kinds of uh, different things that can happen because of disturbed sleep. Now, when people have all these things, the, the thing they go for is sleep aids. They want some kind of a pill. They want those things that can make them fall asleep. But the ideal is you want to improve your sleep hygiene. You, pills have a role and medication has a role, uh, but that shouldn't be our first step. Uh, we want to learn how to develop a good sleep hygiene. And, and, and the way we do that is when we wake up in the morning, we expose ourselves to light. Uh, and that'll set the brain uh, for the circadian rhythm. And then we stay up during the day. We don't take frequent naps. Uh, we don't drink too much coffee, uh, especially in the later part of the day. And then uh, the second uh, bullet point here is a bedtime ritual. So this is another part of our sleep hygiene that you develop some kind of a bedtime ritual. Uh, you know, you put on your pajamas, you relax, you avoid stressful activities. All those things that our, our Dr. Laporta and Dr. Bathia were telling us, don't watch those shows on TV that are going to give you stress. And, and here in, in, in my presentation, I'm gonna say that's gonna stimulate your brain. You don't want to watch all kinds of shows. Uh, you want to watch something that's going to relax your brain and, and, or any kind of tense discussion. Uh, what I would suggest is read some book that is very lighthearted uh, and, and, and that will set your brain up to fall asleep. And then a peaceful bedroom. Keep this room free of all kinds of distracting clutter. You know, we live in a time where uh, we have a laptop on our nightstand or, you know, our cell phone is on our nightstand. And our previous speakers, uh, they gave us all good reasons why not to do that. And that uh, also helps us uh, with our sleep. Uh, no electronics at least 30 minutes before bed. This is very, very important. And you know, sometimes those blue lights that we have coming from our laptops, our printers, and we have them all in the bedroom <laughs> or, or from our phones, 
uh, these are all going to disturb our sleep in the night. Uh, we may not uh, realize that they are disturbing because we think that we actually slept, uh, but it, it, it shows up in our, uh, in our uh, you know, activities the next day. Then darkness in the evening, that's very important. So, so, so you want your bedroom to be dark. Uh, curtains or whatever means that we can have to keep our bedroom as dark as possible is going to help us uh, with our sleep hygiene. So these are some of the things. But again, it's, uh, you know, if we do uh, some of these things or follow these, and do them regularly, uh, you will notice that there is a difference now in our sleep. So before we, we go to the sleep uh, aids or any kind of medication, it's better to just keep a few of these things in mind. And then, of course, if it's uh, still not helping us, we, we, we did wake up in the morning and we did all those things that we talked about. We are not drinking too much coffee not having a nightcap, and still we have problems sleeping, then it means that it, it can be something like a sleep disorder. And if that's the case, then that needs to be evaluated. Uh, I put here uh, one of the disorders, which is called obstructive sleep apnea. And this is the most common sleep disorder. Uh, there are other kinds of apneas as well. There are other kinds of sleep disorders uh, like narcolepsy, but they are uh, not common. This is the one that's uh, most common uh, in, in, in our population. And what obstructive sleep apnea means is that it blocks the oxygen from going into our lungs when we are asleep. Uh, you may have sleep. Now, how, how, how do you recognize that? Now, if someone snores loudly and they gasp or they seem to choke at night when they are asleep, that's a good sign that there might be something and you, you want to get evaluated for that. Okay. Uh, we have to start to wrap this up. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. No, I was enjoying uh, listening to you. And I, the reason I let you speak is because there wasn't a question earlier about sleep apnea and how it affects your sleep. But there are there have been a couple of questions that come through the chat that I would like to get to. Um, yes. So, um, thank you for the presentation. Um, one of the questions was, how long does it take to recover after many years of working the night shift? The people worked the night shift many, many years, and now they're like on a day shift but they still can't sleep at night. Any recommendations? How long does that process usually take to, sh to shift over from night work to day work? Yes, that's an excellent, excellent question and a very relevant one. Uh, so the answer to that is it's, it's adapting yourself. And it's first, it's not gonna be easy and it will take some time, but if we can do it a little bit methodically, uh, like you, you know, start delaying falling asleep during the day by say, for example, start with one hour. If you, you were, you know, doing a shift work and now you come home and start falling asleep at 10 o'clock, start delaying it by one hour, make it 11 and do that for a few days and then make it 12 and so on and so forth. Uh, so there is no right number that it's going to take one week or two weeks or one month or two months. It all depends on how much you have adapted already to staying awake in the night. But but that's a methodical way to do it. Okay. Um, one more question. Uh, if you're sleepy and you lay down for a nap, but you can't actually fall asleep, any recommendations? What should you do? Should you continue to lay there to try to nap, or should you get up and do something? What's the best way to deal with, you know, right. if you're feeling so, sleepy and you feel like you need a nap, but you can't fall asleep? Yes, that's again a great question. Uh, the, the answer for that is if you cannot fall asleep, it's better to get up 
and do some activity. And, and the reason there is we, we have to tire ourselves or the brain to think that now we need sleep. So if you are not falling asleep, chances are, unless you have insomnia, chances are that you are not tired enough. Okay, okay. Um, but those are the two questions that came through the chat. I thank you so much for your time. Um, we're gonna move on to uh, Ruth Ann, where she's going to introduce the next section of our speaking. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mark. Great. Thank you so much, Sunil. And once again, Dr. Randall, for facilitating the questions. I truly needed that information, as I'm sure many of you did as well. Um, so great information to hear about sleep cycles and the impact of sleep on our behaviors, health, and the dangers around lack of sleep. So a round of applause for Sunil. And thanks again to Dr. Randall. Now, guess what? We're at it again. We're going to raffle two more prizes and they will also be $25 gift cards that are eligible to those who registered by 8.30 this morning. So we'll kick off the, the raffle. Thank you so much, Ruth Ann. We are excited. It is that time. But before we continue again, we want to reiterate what Ruth Ann just said. And we want to thank everyone for uh, this wonderful information. Please let us know in the chat how much you appreciated all of the wonderful information from our workshop presenter, as well as our keynote speakers this morning. So just let everyone know that we are definitely going to put these things in action. Um, I know I definitely will, but we have some wonderful information to share with you via our event program. So please visit that link in the chat. And we're going to turn it over to our raffle facilitator. I think we're ready for a couple of more winners. Let's spin the wheel. All right, everyone, let's get that two-step going. We're trying to keep those hearts healthy. And I think we do have another lucky winner. It's close. Victoria Law Wright, congratulations. You are a winner. You will receive a $25 gift card. We will make sure that we notify you via your email used to register for today's wonderful event. But that's not all. We have one more winner. Spin that wheel. Doesn't this make you feel like you're in the Caribbean? All right, get ready. We have one more winner. It looks like Danielle Jones, congratulations. You are a big winner for today. You too will receive a $25 gift card. We would like to continue with today's event and we're gonna bring to you our dynamic and beautiful mistress of ceremony, Ruth Ann Page, Ruth Ann. Thank you so much for that wonderful welcome back. Appreciate it. And congratulations once again to both of our winners. That concludes our prizes for the day. So again, hopefully you will spend those gift cards well. We will now move on to our second and last workshop for today's event featuring Jennifer Klein, who we have the pleasure of her sharing a great visual and informational experience while discussing healthy eating on a budget and plant-based diets. Jennifer is a registered dietitian nutritionist with Mammoth Medical Center's Lot Live Well Center, located in Eatontown. Jennifer earned her degree in food and nutrition sciences from Montclair State University, her master's degree at the George Washington University, where she studied exercise, nutrition, and eating behaviors, and completed her dietetic internship through co the College of St. Elizabeth. Upon completion, once again, the lovely Dr. Randall will facilitate your questions. So please continue to use the chat feature. Jennifer, take it away. Thank you. Good morning, almost afternoon, everyone. 
Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Jennifer Klein. And um, as mentioned, I am a registered dietitian nutritionist. And I um, work here at Mammoth Medical Center's Live Well Center located in Eatontown. So just a quick overview of what we do here at the Live Well Center. We are part of Mammoth Medical Center's Community Health Department. Um, so we offer in our um, suite here at, in the Ann Vogel Family Care and Wellness Center building right near the Mammoth Mall, we offer all free health and nutrition education programming. So we have a wide variety of health education programs that happen here in our center, educational programs and lectures. And I oversee the nutrition education portion of our center. A lot of our nutrition education programs happen right here in our We Forum demonstration kitchen, where we teach in-person and virtual cooking classes. Um, so that's what we're going to do today and make it kind of an educational um, cooking demonstration. And I think, you know, it's been such a great morning so far. I've definitely learned a lot. And so I hope you learn a lot and have fun watching our, our demonstration. I'll also um, be sure to put our, our calendar and or where you can find our events, which are all free um, here in Eatontown. Uh, we'll make sure that you know where to find our events. All right, so let's get started with our demo for today. So I was asked to speak a little bit about Heart healthy eating, of course, to tie into the whole topic for today, but then also eating on a budget, which I think is something that is top of mind for everyone right now, because food prices, as you probably know, have risen a lot over the past year or so, um, and talking a little bit about plant-based eating as well. So I love this topic because it all ties in together really, really well. So let's start with talking about eating on a budget. This is something that, you know, is important to a lot of us right now, but I've been a dietitian for about 12 years. And it's something that my clients that I've worked with over the years, it's, it's, it's always something that we're thinking about, right? We talked about stress earlier this morning, and sometimes our budgets can be stressful. And I like to help people take the stress out of their eating. So make healthy eating easy um, and fit into any budget. Eating healthfully can sometimes get the reputation of being very, very ex expensive and maybe unattainable because of that expense. But I love to share with people that, you know, we don't have to purchase specialty ingredients or specialty foods in order to create healthy heart, heart uh, healthy meals. We can take a lot of these staple foods that we have in our grocery stores and maybe in your pantry and in your refrigerator right now and create really healthful meals. One of the ways that we can do that do that is by um, embracing plant-based eating or plant-forward eating. So not necessarily becoming vegetarian, but maybe incorporating plant-based proteins a little bit more often. And by plant-based proteins, I mean things like beans and lentils and nuts and seeds. So what we're going to focus on in our cooking demonstration today are lentils, which are a very affordable, very delicious type of plant-based protein. And there's lots of things that we can do with lentils. What I'm gonna start cooking up right now is a golden lentil soup. So you may have had lentil soup before. This is a nice kind of different spicy um, twist on your typical lentil soup. So let's get started with that. I have my pan heating here on about medium high, um, and I'm going to drizzle in a little bit of olive oil. So you may have heard before, Olive oil is a great heart healthy option for cooking and for drizzling on salads and things like that, which is totally true. Olive oil is one of our healthiest types of oils that we can use. However, sometimes it can be a little bit more expensive, right? So if you don't have olive oil on hand, you don't want to use your olive oil for something like a soup, any um, liquid oil or any plant oil will be fine. So something like a canola oil is typically more affordable and it is just as heart healthy. It has a lot of omega-3 fatty acids. So that would be a great option as well. So whatever oil, plant-based oil you have, you can drizzle in your pan, let, start to let that heat up. Next up, we're gonna add in some of our base vegetables for our soup. So like most soups, we are gonna start out with some onion. So I have one yellow onion. I, took, I chose a pretty large one and I chopped it up into little dices. And I'm just gonna add that into my pot, which feels like it's pretty hot now and start to let those sweat out. Let's get all of that good, delicious onion into our pot. In addition to that, we're going to add some carrots. 
So I have two relatively large peeled and chopped carrots. Our carrots are going to add a lot of vitamin A and beta carotene um, right into our soup. So I like, you can cut them into any size chunks that you like. I like to do these little half moon sizes because um, I like to really taste the carrots when they're in there. And I'm just gonna add that in as well. So I'm gonna start to stir this around, really just letting those vegetables soften a little bit. You can see that those lovely colors already. And now keep in mind, I'm using the onion and the carrot for my, the base of my soup. You can really mix and match a lot of your vegetables. So if you happen to have some celery on hand, that makes a great base for our soups as well. And then other types of vegetables as well. I love to use up all of the vegetables that I purchase, really make the, the most out of the money that I spend for my vegetables. So sometimes I might have, you know, little slices of pepper left over, so a bell pepper, or maybe even leftover cooked vegetables as well. That might be really delicious, but not quite enough to fill up, you know, a, a whole plate for a meal. Those are great to add to your base of your soup. So you can really be creative and use what you have on hand um, for your soup. All right, I'm gonna turn down my heat just a little bit. And I'm going to add in my garlic. So I have two cloves of garlic here that I just minced up. I'm gonna pop that in. The other thing, these types of vegetables are usually pretty affordable. Um, when we go to the grocery store, you know, I, of course, as a dietitian, always encourage people to eat more fruits and vegetables. They are so healthy for us, heart healthy for us. The more color and variety we get out of our fruits and vegetables, the better it is for our overall health. So there's a couple ways in our produce department that we can save some money. So sometimes getting um, the larger bags of things, so like the onions, instead of get, getting them single, getting them in the two pound bag is a little bit more affordable. Also eating with the seasons as well. So um, during, especially the springtime and the winter time, New Jersey starts to have a lot of uh, more local fruits and vegetables. And so buying locally and buying what's in season is often less expensive and also tastes better as well. And it supports the local farmer, farmers, which is great too. All right, from here, as those continue to cook down, we're going to season up our soup a little bit with some fun seasonings. So we are going to be using some cumin today. So cumin is a nice warm spice. It's not spicy, so not like temp, um, uh, going to make your, your tongue burn or anything, but it adds a nice warm flavor to your meals. Some uh, Often we taste cumin in like taco mixes and things like that. Um, and then also some like um, Middle Eastern Mediterranean rest, uh, recipes as well. So I'm putting in a teaspoon and a half of my cumin. And my temperature right now is on like medium low because we just want to toast those these um, spices a little bit. The other spice that I'm going to put in is turmeric. So turmeric is a really wonderful spice. You may have heard of some benefits from turmeric for being anti-inflammatory and helping um, uh, support um, our, our stress levels and things like that. Um, so it's a really great thing to add into our meals. And it also just adds a really great flavor and color. So I mentioned that this is a golden lentil soup. Our gold color is going to come partly from this beautiful turmeric. And so using herbs and spices in our cooking is another great way to support our heart health because when we're using these flavor, flavorful herbs and spices, we often don't need quite as much salt. So if you've been told that you have high blood pressure, we really want to limit the salt that we're taking in to about 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams per day. And that can add up really quickly, um, especially when we're eating a lot of, um, you know, pre-cooked foods, frozen foods, canned foods, and things like that. Um, there are a lot of low sodium um, options out there, um, but it can add up quickly. So by using herbs and spices, we can really flavor our food without having to pick up that salt shaker. And any, a lot of different spices will go with this recipe as well. So I'm using the cumin and turmeric. Those are spices that I happen to have on hand a lot because I love the flavor of them. But if you don't have them on hand, look in your pantry and see what you have. Lentils go well with a variety of different spices. So you can do things like sage and rosemary and thyme, um, oregano, 
parsley, whatever you have in your cabinet, you can flavor up and make it your own. All right, moving on, I'm gonna turn up my heat just a little bit and add in my vegetable broth. So my vegetable broth is a low sodium vegetable broth. So again, as I mentioned, if we have high blood pressure, we wanna make sure that we are keeping our sodium levels in check, about 1500 to 2000 milligrams, or you can think 2000 milligrams or less. Soups, unfortunately, canned soups, boxed broths can sometimes have a lot of sodium in them. Sometimes, sometimes our entire day's worth of sodium. So really trying to look for low sodium options is very helpful. And there are so many out there now. Um, so I'm using a low sodium vegetable broth. You can even find salt free or no salt added broths. Those are great options because then you can flavor up your soup and control the amount of sodium going in there. All right, so I am putting eight cups of broth in here and we're going to let that warm up a little bit. And then we're going to turn it over to the star of our soup today, which is our red lentils. So if you are not familiar with lentils, lentils are a great um, versatile plant-based protein. They come in many different colors, including brown and green and yellow. And I love these red lentils. If you've never used them before, um, they're really nice because they cook up super quickly. They also have a great lentil flavor and look how pretty they are. Isn't that a beautiful bowl of lentils? Um, so with our lentils, any lentil, dried lentils or beans, we want to make sure that we just take a little look at them, make sure that there's no little hidden um, pebbles or stones in there that can be left over from the processing. But once you know that your bowl of lentils looks good, we're gonna add this all in. So this is 16 ounces of lentils. In the 16 ounce lentil bag, there are 10 servings of plant-based protein. And this little bag of lentils, 16 ounces, is only um, $1.89 at the grocery store. So under $2 to get 10 servings of plant-based protein. So not bad. I am just going to give this a little stir. One of the greatest things about red lentils in particular is that they cook very quickly. So we're going to let this come to a boil and then that is just gonna simmer for about 15 to 20 minutes and then our soup will be done. Very, very simple. So with the magic of television, I am going to do a little switcheroo and we are going to have our beautiful pot of lentil soup already done and cooked. So, our soup now is perfect as it is. So there's lots of flavor in there. You can see all of those eight cups of broth really were absorbed there. We have this very thick and lovely looking soup. So it's perfect as it is right now, but I'm going to add just a few more things to kind of jazz it up a little bit. So I'm gonna turn down my heat just a touch. And we are going to add in First of all, a little bit more vegetable. Again, as a dietitian, I love adding vegetables in. I'm going to use this um, baby spinach. So I'm just gonna take a couple of handfuls. If you've ever cooked with spinach before, you know that a big bag of spinach turns into a very little bit of spinach once it's cooked down. So I'm gonna take a nice big handful and I'm going to just kind of rip it and tear it and put it right into my nice warm soup. And it's just gonna wilt down. Again, what you can utilize the vegetables that you already have on hand. So if you have another green on hand, like a, uh, let's say kale or something like that, that would be fine in here or even leftover veggies. So if you have some leftover cauliflower, leftover broccoli, why not just throw that in? It adds another vegetable um, and it allows you to utilize those leftovers and really get the most bang for your buck. All right, and you can see that beautiful green color. In addition, we're gonna add a few more flavor boosters. So one that I'm going to use is some parsley. So this is just some nice parsley. Um, you can get a huge bunch at the grocery store and it adds so much flavor, again, contributing to the flavor of our soup without having to add salt. So I'm gonna add about a couple of tablespoons to a quarter of a cup or so of my fresh parsley. If you don't have the fresh parsley, you don't like the fresh parsley, you don't have to add that. Again, the soup is pretty much gr um, great as it is. And then lastly, a little squeeze of lemon juice. So I have a half of a lemon here and I'm gonna give it a nice squeeze. 
lemon juice is such a powerful flavor um, that can really add so much depth to our recipes and freshness to our recipes. Again, without adding that salt is really a great replacement for salt. So we have so much flavor here in our soup. And it just takes about 20 minutes to 30 minutes to put together. And then we have this beautiful golden lentil soup with those nice specks of green in there. And so just to, you know, kind of wrap up everything I know is a really quick cooking demo, um, really in utilizing some of those plant-based proteins are so helpful for helping to keep with our budget, but then also extremely healthy for our heart too. So one recommendation from the American Heart Association is to try to incorporate more plant-based proteins. And the reason for that is because our, our animal proteins tend to come along with saturated fat and saturated fat is connected to higher cholesterol levels or promotes our body to make more cholesterol for some people. So by incorporating um, plant-based proteins like beans and nuts and seeds and lentils, instead of our proteins, at least a couple times per week can really help us to decrease our total intake of that saturated fat and really get, still get the benefits of all that great protein. Plus beans and lentils are full of fiber, which can help to lower cholesterol levels as well. Um, and again, they're affordable. They're extremely versatile. You can take lentils and you can make soups with them, but you can also make lentil tacos. You can make salads with your lentils. Um, so there's a lot of great recipes and great things that you can do with this little $2 bag of lentils. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Okay, well, thank you so much, Jennifer. You're welcome. Um, we did have we did have one question put through the chat. It said, "Is bone broth better than beef broth?" Bone broth. Okay, so bone broth. Um, there are different flavors of bone broth. Um, usually, you see chicken bone broth. The main difference is that with the bone broth, they include um, the collagen, and so that adds protein to the broth. So that is a good way. It's not necessarily, it's actually not a plant-based protein, but it is a low fat protein. Um, so to get a little bit more protein in your, your pot of soup, you can use a bone broth, which will give you that chickeny flavor. And then also typically about 10 grams of protein per cup of that broth. So um, that could certainly be a way to increase your protein in a soup. Okay. Um, another question is, you talked about different ways to, um, you know, shop healthy on a budget. Um, and meal planning is sort of one of those important ways that, you know, you plan out your meals and everything. Do you have a good tip for meal planning? Because a lot of people find meal planning very difficult, actually. Yeah, <laughs> that's a really great question. So meal planning is really important, right? So especially, um, when we're going to the grocery store, if we don't have a plan, sometimes we end up grabbing these, you know, random things and we get back home. We say like, how are we going to put this all together to make, make my meals, um, more impulse buying too. Right. So one thing to do is, um, during the week, if you get the sales ads that come to your house in the mail, um, you can flip through those or pick up whichever uh, store you go to. They usually have apps where it'll show you what the sales are for that week. And so what I usually recommend for, for people is to take a minute to really think about the week. So think about what you have going on, what nights you need to cook, um, and, or needs what nights you need to have meals on the table. Um, what the schedule is going to look like. Do we need really quick meals? Can I, you know, have a little bit longer time to cook and then utilize, um, those sales to kind of build the meals that make sense for you for that week. Um, there's going to be things those, you know, sometimes we need those staple foods. Sometimes we need those like snack foods for our kids, lunch boxes and things like that. So creating a nice list and then going to the grocery store with that list and sticking with that list as much as possible. Grocery stores, you know, they can be overwhelming at times. There's so many great, um, looking foods, but when we have that list and we try to stick to it, it can really help us, you know, not spend that extra money on those, those things that were, um, that are on the end caps that look appetizing. Um, so really just kind of planning it out and really keeping in mind 
what's going on for your week. Are you going to have time to cook all these things? Are you going to need to cook a bigger batch of food and then just have those leftovers that are easier to reheat for yourself? Um, and that's part of, you know, what we do here in the demonstration kitchen is really help to give people ideas for what to do. You know, a lot of what we do are you know, simple meals that are about like 20 minutes or less to put together or something that utilizes leftovers. So cook once and, and eat twice or three times or whatever it is. So um, really, you know, just sitting down and making that time to plan is really important. Do you recommend people buy frozen or canned vegetables or I mean because some people they yeah. can't find really fresh vegetables so how do frozen and canned vegetables into your absolutely diet? especially when we're talking about again sticking to a budget that's you know a, a really great option is our frozen and our canned and so again you know sometimes we get this conception uh, that healthy eating has to be expensive because we have to get all these fresh fruits and vegetables to meet our, our vegetable intake um but every form of fruits and vegetable count. So um, our fresh fruits and vegetables are frozen and are canned. So frozen vegetables are a great option. They are frozen um, at the peak of their freshness. And as long as they're not adding any sauces or anything like that, there's no sodium, nothing added to them. Um, so they're great because you can get a bag of them. You can use what you need for that night and the rest of it stays nice and fresh in your freezer. Canned fruits and vegetables are fine as well. One concern that we would have with canned vegetables is, of course, the sodium that they may add to it. Um, so, you know, simply rinsing and draining your canned vegetables takes out about 30% of that sodium. And then you can, there are most varieties of vegetables that are on the shelves now um, have a, a low sodium or a no salt added variety. So you can look for those as well. And a lot of times I know we do a lot of our shopping um, here at the, the local shop, right? And they have those canned can sales and they have those times where, you know, we can really stock up on these canned foods. And so that is a great thing to have. And I, I always encourage people to kind of have those kind of backup things, right? So have those canned fruits and vegetables and you're frozen ready to go. And then as you go through your week, you know, picking up that produce, that fresh produce that you, that you really need, or that you really enjoy, and then having those frozen and um, canned to be your, your, um, your go-tos um, aside from those fresh are really great options as well and healthy. Well, thank you very much for your time. I think our time is up. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for your demonstration. The soup looked excellent. I've actually made a red lentil soup before and it's actually really, really good. Awesome. And it does last a couple of days in the refrigerator. So it's an excellent go-to to grab for lunch or something. Definitely. And the um, recipe will be in the packet of information um, that everybody is, is getting. Um, and then definitely come and check out our Live Well Center. It is beautiful. Um, and the benefit of coming to a class in person is you get to smell it and you get to taste it. So come and check us out sometime. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. That's great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was fantastic. I mean, who needs the Food Network? We have it all right here today. So as mentioned, please refer to your program booklets for information on eating healthy on a budget and a few healthy eating recipes. So again, a round of applause for Jennifer and thanks again, Dr. Tanya Randall. So in closing, hopefully you have enjoyed our program today. We'll accept all your comments, whether you're on social media or in our Zoom session. But most importantly, I hope uh, and trust that you became more aware about the importance of heart health factors and associated preventative tips and other helpful information. Thank you to all of our panelists, presenters, and program participants today. On behalf of today's event co-sponsors, the Central Jersey Club, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, Monmouth County Alumni Chapter, and Concerned Black Nurses of Central New Jersey. We thank all of you for attending today. And we also thank all of our committee members who helped to put this program together. But please stay connected with us. Uh, the contact information is on the slides. It's available in the programs you received. And if you follow the Central Jersey Club on YouTube, you will also find a recording of today's session. As we depart, please enjoy the rest of your day and spread the word regardless of age 
manage and reduce your heart health risk through daily lifestyle changes. And then may you all be heart healthy. Good day, folks.